Welcome everybody to the 2020 Penn State Center for Acoustics and Vibration Annual Workshop. It used to be a spring workshop, now it's fall. And of course, yeah, we're all uh, doing this. Um, I, this morning, I really felt strange not uh, greeting everybody in the usual place and um, catching up on uh, what everybody's up to. And um, this is certainly unique and a grand experiment. And I'm hoping that uh, you get value out of it. We got a lot of great content for you. Hopefully you've had a chance to get onto the YouTube site and watch some of it. And the intent today is give short overviews and get some discussion going. And uh, we'll see how that, uh, how that works with Zoom. Uh, for those of you that have not been here before, a little bit of background, uh, first on Penn State and then on the CAV. We're obviously an old university and we're a big university. A lot of you guys know that. Uh, one notable thing is we officially crossed the $1 billion a year mark in research uh, last year. So that's a pretty big milestone. Uh, this gives you an idea of the breadth of work uh, that happens here at Penn State. Now, the CAV is a, a campus-wide consortium, I call it, of uh, any faculty and student uh, working in sound of vibration that, that wants to participate. So we don't teach classes, we don't grant degrees, we're a grouping of people that are in other academic departments, most often in College of Engineering. And you'll see those as we kind of go through the talks today, uh, some of the professors for different departments. Uh, I'm the director, that's me in the upper right. I work at the Applied Research Lab, and I'm also a research faculty in the grad program in acoustics. And over the left there is uh, Cliff Lissenden, associate director. He is in engineering science and mechanics. Uh, you've already heard from Kelly. She works in um, Penn State conferences and institutes and has been doing a great job putting all this stuff together, along with Diane Beerley, who is our CV coordinator in engineering science and mechanics. Now, the CV is split into, at the moment, eight affinity groups. And this goes back a long way in time. The groups have evolved a bit as um, different uh, topics have become hot over time. Uh, and so I've tried to break it down into three sub areas, but there's a lot of cross crossing over between members of the groups, as you'll see, as we go through some of the talks. So these are not hard and fast barriers by any means, but there's really kind of three basic physics groups. Uh, I also run the structural vibration acoustics group. Uh, Mike Johnson, is the flow induced noise and vibration group leader. And then Vic Sparrow, who's also the chair of our graduate program in acoustics, runs the propagation and radiation group. And the next three, I, I kind of lumped into applications because this is really applying a lot of the basic physics to special problems. So Jose Palacios runs our adaptive structures and noise control group. Uh, he'll give a kind of a neat talk later on uh, rotorcraft uh, de-icing, uh, kind of an adaptive uh, problem. And then uh, there's a lot of work going on in high frequency, uh, guided waves, ultrasonic waves, and uh, trying to um, uh, look for flaws in structures, predict remaining useful life. Uh, that's the Systems and Structures Health Management Group at Carl and Cliff uh, co-run. And then uh, Ed Smith has uh, run a rotorcraft acoustics and dynamics group for, for many years. And he in fact runs an even bigger group, the Vertical Lift Research and Center for Excellence. And he'll talk about that a little bit uh, when he gets his turn. And then we're always trying to stay abreast of, of new areas. And so Amanda uh, has taken over what used to be the acoustic materials group, and uh, we've now added metamaterials. That's really become a hot topic around the world, as you might've noticed through some of the uh, talks that have already been pre-recorded. And then we're really pleased that we've been accelerating our work in biomedical acoustics. And Julie Simon has been leading that group for a few years. And we got a lot of people around campus in different departments that uh, work in biomedical acoustics. So. The intent is to bring faculty and students together that might not ordinarily know about each other, uh, share ideas, share the uh, methods that work well, that don't work well. And then of course, at our annual workshop, share all of that with you. I believe Vic is on the line and normally we have a special separate talk in the grad program in acoustics, but uh, what I've done is lumped a couple of slides into my overview here. And so Vic will maybe talk about that a bit. They've got their own website, as you can see here. And there's also some courses coming up that a lot of distance education people can participate in as well. So Vic, if you'd like to talk for the next three slides Thank for you, me. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I hope you can hear me and see me. Uh, again, I'd like to, again, join everyone in welcoming you back to Penn State. Uh, welcome for people who have never been here before. We're this is very different for all of us. At the same time, we're really glad that 
uh, we can still provide a number of the uh, cutting edge education and cutting edge science and technology uh, that you're interested in. So we're very happy to do that. So here's a quick look at our uh, website for the graduate program in acoustics. Uh, we're one of the academic departments in the College of Engineering. There are a number of other academic departments which are under the CAV umbrella. Uh, the graduate program in acoustics is the one purposely focused on acoustics and vibration type topics. We do offer a number of courses uh, to resident students, but most of our courses are have been offered uh, to remote students since 1987. Uh, so when we had to switch to Zoom, uh, all our courses were currently running through Zoom anyway. So again, it was a transition for us, maybe easier than from other uh, academic programs. Steve, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, and so again, uh, if you're interested in our website, it's www.acs.psu.edu. And there you can find information specifically about our distance education program. We do have uh, over 100 students from different companies who currently take our courses. And many of those are seeking to try to receive a master of engineering degree in acoustics uh, remotely. Next slide, please. And so the one thing that I did want to put forward is we have put out our list of courses which are available for the spring 2021 semester. So uh, I know it takes a couple weeks to get things the paperwork through your companies, but if you're interested in any of these particular courses, we'd be very happy to have you take them. I'll take you, uh, just point out that we do have a new course being offered this semester related to psychoacoustics and sound quality for all of those of you interested in that topic. And there are a number of other very interesting basic acoustics courses, uh, transducers, uh, biomedical ultrasound, outdoor sound, um, applications of vibro and aeroacoustics, otherwise known as musical acoustics. Um, so there's a, a great number of courses we're offering this spring. And uh, I'll also mention in fall, we already are having plans to have a, a class, a full three credit class in acoustic functional materials. Uh, so again, uh, these are some of the things going on. And Steve, thanks for the opportunity to just let people know that this is, this is out there and available. Thanks. Right, and Vic, just to maybe reiterate a key point here, you don't have to necessarily be enrolled in a degree program to take classes. If you just want to take a couple of classes in a certain area, you know, subject to approval by Vic and the instructor. Exactly, so exactly. Yeah. It's a la carte. Most people are adult, working adults, and they know whether they're ready for a class or not. If there's anybody have a question, if they're about the prerequisites and things like that, we'll be very happy to, to help you out with that. Great, thank you, Vic. Uh, so back to the CAV, for those of you that have not been uh, members and are maybe just coming in for the first time, a great way to catch up on things along with this workshop is to go look at some of our newsletters. And uh, so here is in fact the CAV website, cv.psu.edu. And if you scroll down the left, you'll find newsletters. And if you just click on that picture, it will bring up uh, the latest and greatest newsletter. And this is the first year that we had this done by our College of Engineering Communications Group. And boy, they did a great job. If you, you know, I'm almost ashamed to show you the links to the previous newsletters because they're all kind of, you know, done by us non-professionals. I mean, they were okay. They, they certainly summarized what we're up to, but uh, when I finally turned it into the hands of the professionals, things got a whole lot nicer. So I think you'll notice a big improvement this year. There's a lot more content. Uh, it just looks really snazzy. So I highly recommend you, you download that. And it gives you a lot more details on some of the, the work that's going on here as well. Uh, so here is the table of contents. And I just want to highlight a few things you'll find in this year's issue. Uh, up here is Micah Shepard. And uh, he did a fun project with Martin Guitar, who's been one of our long time CAV sponsors. Uh, just looking at the vibroacoustics of uh, guitars and he did modal analyses on them. And the whole idea was, can you take measurements, just basic measurements that are quantitative and somehow link that to um, you know, qualitative assessments. So Martin took some of these measurements on various guitars and then compared uh, what they got to uh, what some of the um, more subjective uh, tests might uh, show you. People in a room listening to somebody play the guitars, for example, and uh, started trying to uh, link those two together. That's still work that's ongoing, but there's a nice little summary you'll find here in uh, the newsletter. 
Uh, if you're wondering what this is, this is probably one of the, the nicest, coolest images I've seen of a really hot topic, acoustic black holes. And uh, this is some work that um, is going on with uh, Ed Smith and Steve Conlon. And uh, you'll find uh, some details on that as well. And a uh, graduate student over in aerospace engineering. And you're looking at a bunch of holes kind of tamped into a plate and vibrations and radiated sound. And there's a lot of good stuff here to, to check out. Uh, we're also excited to announce that uh, there's a new center at Penn State in gas turbine research, and that's Jackie O'Connor up there in the mechanical engineering department. So we are not the only center at Penn State. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them, all focused on different uh, key topics. And uh, there's definitely some overlap in the gas turbine folks. Uh, obviously, gas turbines vibrate. There's concern about fatigue failure, and of course, they make noise. So there's a lot of ties there. And those of you that are longtime members have probably uh, interacted with Marty Trethaway over the years, a longtime mold analysis guy and dynamics guy, uh, kind of moved on into inter international uh, relations between Penn State and other um, institutions, and uh, just retired over the past year. So uh, congrats, Marty, on a great career, and uh, hope uh, the retirement goes well. You'll also find in the newsletter a list of uh, recent CV student graduates. And uh, you can also go to the website and we have a student thesis database. So uh, over here again on the left-hand side, you'll find members and technical groups. And uh, these are sorted by year and uh, author last name. But if you wanna search for a particular author or a particular keyword, you can just type it in and it'll pop up. And 90% uh, plus of the time, these thesis links work and take you to PDF. Sometimes they don't for some of the older ones, but almost all the modern ones. Uh, you can go ahead and download the PDF directly from the Penn State Library. We had been doing a pretty good job of bringing you seminars each semester. Of course, I got tougher in the spring and the summer, but uh, we did get a few out. Now, this is not something you can link to on the website. This is really uh, intended to be a benefit to our members only. And so you have to know the link. So here it is, it's uh, the usual website. And then you put a slash and then type seminars.aspx. And that should take you there. And what you'll find is a bunch of links to pre recorded videos. Uh, Penn State in the last year switched the communications platform that we use to communicate with you guys um, to Zoom. And at the same time, also switched the way we store recorded videos. So, Dan Russell, and thanks very much to Dan has been going back in time and converting everything over to the new format, which is something called Kaltura, if you haven't heard of that. And we've got past seminars back through 2016, spring 2016. And when Dan finds time, he uh, converts some of the other ones, but uh, we'll, we'll get all of them online eventually. But these go back to you know, 2011, something like that. So we got a lot of years of seminars uh, for you. And again, the last few years are certainly available to you now. Uh, welcome to our corporate sponsors. Uh, we have a lot of you, and we're also glad to see that um, we have a lot of extra registrants this year, about more than twice as many as we usually do. And I think a lot of folks are kind of watching uh, offline, and hopefully you'll watch some of these uh, videos that we're recording now later on and get back to us with any questions. And I think there's a lot more registrants. In fact, I know there's a lot more uh, because you don't have to travel here. Uh, so this has actually made us think for future workshops, are we going to allow uh, remote registrants? And so... One of the things I wanted to mention is at the end of all this, we're gonna send out a very short poll and we'll make it short so it doesn't take you more than a minute or two to fill out. But uh, one of the questions we're gonna ask is in the future, you know, would you attend a, uh, a mixed uh, session? Uh, do you prefer live? Do you prefer doing these online? Are you not sure? Would you never attend another workshop again? Uh, so we'll, we'll send out that uh, questionnaire uh, later on in the week uh, so we can get your feedback. But uh, I think we're liking the idea of a mixed format just because it allows more people from our corporate sponsors to attend because not everybody can afford uh, to uh, travel to, to Penn State. We have some new sponsors this year and there are a couple more uh, hopefully uh, waiting in the wings. So welcome to A.O. Smith. And uh, although Westinghouse, I've got them listed as new, they, they're a long time sponsor. It's just uh, they had to stop for a while. And I'm very pleased uh, that they're back in particular, thanks to Greg Banier uh, for making that happen. Uh, Greg is actually going to participate in one of our sessions on Wednesday in the AI and machine learning session. So we look forward to continued interactions with uh, A.O. Smith and Westinghouse. 
Uh, we also routinely invite a lot of uh, corporate guests, folks that are not yet members, but we hope to become one day. And uh, we've got a lot of people online, hopefully, <laughs> that are from these companies. Uh, some, again, are past CAV sponsors. They just uh, disappeared, and maybe we're hoping they, they come back. Uh, Boeing, Moog, Newport News, uh, among some of them, Volvo Construction Equipment. And again, a bunch of uh, new people that uh, we're welcoming you here. So if at the end of all this, you have any questions about benefits of CV membership, obviously, please um, get back in touch, and we're happy to talk to you. One of the benefits of being a CAV corporate sponsor, along with attending the workshop and catching up with us and our students and hopefully hiring our students, is that uh, you're entitled to a day of advising. And what that means is uh, you get in touch with me, let me know about a problem that uh, you're having or concerned about, and I'll connect you with CAV faculty members that uh, have some expertise in that area. And so this is just uh, the perfect example of this. Uh, Babcock and Wilcox have been sponsors for a while now. And uh, they've taken us up on these days of advising. And this particular one led to a small project. Uh, so the day of advising is meant to get us familiar with your issues, uh, offer up some initial thoughts. And if of interest, uh, suggest a, a research project that uh, might uh, be useful in helping you out with your problems. In this case, there was an in-plant issue with a package boiler. And Babcock and Wilcox, very low frequency pulsations that would appear and disappear. And uh, we're quite frankly flummoxing everybody. It's like, why do they show up? And when they do show up, the vibration and the noise was, was quite loud. And uh, Tyler Dare and Jackie O'Connor and some other folks uh, got involved, uh, suggested that the problem may be some sort of thermoacoustic resonance. Uh, a project was set in place, NDAs were signed. Uh, everybody went off to the plant, took some measurements, and uh, what you're seeing here are a whole bunch of vibrations that were measured over the surface of the furnace, along with some of the ducting, uh, which just showed this very low frequency pulsating mode uh, that would uh, turn on and off uh, depending on certain conditions. And everything was written up in an internoise conference paper, which is publicly released. And uh, if you can't find that or are interested, let me know and we can grab that for you. But this is the kind of thing that CV corporate sponsorship can uh, buy you. Uh, there's different ways to sponsor work at the CV and at Penn State. It wouldn't actually be a CV sponsored work to be with the individual faculty member. Uh, sometimes uh, these are student projects. Sometimes they're these small consulting jobs like the one I just showed you on the last slide. Uh, but there's something called the Penn State Funding Matrix. And I've got a link to that down below. And uh, that just shows you all the different ways of funding Penn State. Uh, the easiest <laughs> is something called a gift, and that is a no strings attached gift, and there really cannot be any strings attached, no deliverables, anything like that. Uh, that doesn't happen too often, and the next step up would be uh, something called a grant, and it always boils down to some discussion on intellectual property, or IP for short, and a completely unrestricted grant means that uh, you just fund the work, but Penn State owns the intellectual property. Again, that's, that's rare. What is a little more common is a restricted grant with a Penn State owning the IP, but with a license to option, or the most frequent one is some sort of a contract where the IP is in fact assigned to the sponsor, but as always, terms and conditions apply. So uh, lawyers would be involved, NDAs, all of that good stuff, but uh, these are not insurmountable problems. We, we work through them all the time. So uh, if you've got something you wanna work on with a faculty member or a student, uh, we can help you make that happen. So just get in touch and we can talk about it. Uh, we also have many government liaisons, not as many as our corporate liaisons, but um, we're happy to have them. Uh, a lot of times they'll come in and give talks at the workshop. That's uh, not necessarily happening this year, but we hope to renew that tradition next year, hopefully for live and in person again. And uh, so uh, here we've got folks from each one of these agencies, uh, at least registered and hopefully participating today and over the next couple of days. And uh, these guys sometimes sponsor student research as well, as you'll see when we go through our summaries and also uh, seek to hire our students. So we're, we're glad of that also. There's a smaller category uh, called a vendor liaison. And what the vendor liaisons do is essentially just give us nice deals on stuff, whether it's hardware, such as PCB, piezotronics, uh, or software like uh, Romax. And I'm pleased to welcome some representatives from MSC Software, 
Um, we had uh, somebody from uh, MSC join us last year, got a couple more this year, and they've uh, since been bought by a company called Hexagon. And uh, just a heads up to Penn State faculty and students, MSC software has been buying a lot of uh, different companies, including Romax. Uh, they just got bought uh, fairly recently. And uh, I'm excited to announce that uh, they are offering up fairly high capability versions of different software packages to Penn State faculty and students working on research projects. So they're going to be watching and learning, looking at the kind of stuff we're doing. And at the end of all this, we'll get together with them again. And they'll talk about uh, different uh, softwares that uh, might fit in well with some of the projects that they're learning about here. If any faculty members or students want to check out their website and get back in touch with me to uh, say, hey, I'd like to use the software, please do so. We'll make you part of that conversation. So this is exactly what the vendor liaison uh, is supposed to be about, is uh, connecting Penn State folks uh, with you guys and hopefully using your stuff. And then the final type of liaison, and I think one of the most exciting, is our international liaison group. And uh, this is just a, a favorite of uh, students in particular and a lot of our corporate and government folks, uh, because the international liaisons come in and tell us what's going on outside the USA. It's, it's very easy to get tunnel vision uh, here in the States, uh, especially if you don't get out to international conferences. Not everybody can. And, and one of the great things about CV is we're bringing these folks to you. And I'm just so grateful to seven out of the eight this year that are in fact participating in a pre-recorded talks, which are going to be part of the international liaison session tomorrow morning, even though they're not coming over here to join us. So it's, it's a tradition that we bring uh, one member of each of these uh, organizations over to Penn State. We pay their way. Uh, they get to meet our students, faculty, everybody else, interact with it. it it's, it's just a big, nice thing about the CV is this international flavor that we get. And so thanks again to all of these uh, liaisons for participating, even though that's not happening this year. This, this really makes me happy. So, so thank you again. Uh, because we're doing this virtually, uh, we just kind of open up registration to anybody that's participated in the past. And so I'm pleased we've got a few international guests from other organizations as well. They're not formal liaisons, but we're certainly happy to have them and uh, are happy that uh, they can contribute uh, in any way they can to this year's workshop. Okay, so with all of that, here is what you're gonna see this afternoon and over the next couple of days. Uh, first off, we've pre-recorded all of the main talks. It's just not realistic to expect everybody to sit there and watch eight hours of content for three days. It, it's just not going to happen. And so we made the decision to pre-record a lot of these things up front. And they're all on the YouTube channel. And uh, we've set uh, up three different playlists, one for today. And I've noticed beforehand that a lot of people have watched pre-watched those recordings. So thank you for that. And uh, what's going to happen next after I get done uh, yammering on is that each of the group heads will get nominally about five minutes to give you some highlights. And then we'll open it up for questions. We had hoped that there'd be a lot of questions on the YouTube site up front. Uh, even though a lot of people watched recordings, I'm not seeing a whole lot of questions and comments. So uh, that'll all happen live, which is fine. And you're welcome to raise questions via the chat uh, or just unmuting a mic and asking them that way. You know, anything works, just, just let us know. Um, tomorrow is a busy day. We have in the morning, the updates from the international uh, liaisons. I should just say international liaisons, not corporate. My apologies for that. Uh, once again, those are all pre-recorded. I've noticed that uh, some of those have been watched ahead of time as well. Hopefully you've got time after this and early tomorrow morning to do the same. The reason it's so early is we have two liaisons from Asia, from Hong Kong Polytechnic Institute and KAIST in South Korea. And they're about 11 or 12 hours ahead. So uh, <laughs> I'm grateful to them. We're actually signing on quite late in the evening, but we had to do it early enough so they could be part of this. So that's the reason for the early start tomorrow morning. We're gonna follow that up afterwards with a virtual lab tour. Uh, when we meet in person, we've always opened up our labs to visitors and that's always been a fun part of the workshop. We can't do that this year, but uh, Michelle Vigeon is going to show you her uh, oralization and sound reproduction facility. And there's a pre-recorded really nice video. It's about three minutes long. And once again, our friends in College of Engineering, Corporate Communications put together uh, that uh, gives you a high level overview of what this is. And it's really something. It's a small anechoic room over in the CV area that's just packed with uh, loudspeakers and a little chair in the middle. And the subject sits in the chair. And thanks to some 
leg work done ahead of time by Michelle and her students. Uh, they take this really cool device called an Eigen mic out into the field and they'll measure essentially the, the acoustic modal behavior of whatever acoustic space they're in, whether it's a concert hall, uh, the inside of an aircraft fuselage, the inside of a, a, an automobile, whatever it is. They'll characterize all those transfer functions and then program them into their facility. And you sit in this anechoic room, close your eyes, and they'll play back different sounds. And it sounds to you like you're in a concert hall, you're in the automobile, wherever that particular environment happens to be. So it's a really neat facility. Uh, Michelle will go through some more details uh, in the actual uh, roundtable and then open it up for, for questions. Then there's a break. And then tomorrow evening we're, or late afternoon, we're really hoping a lot of you outsiders, not Penn Staters, can join us for the student poster competition. I'll show you in a minute uh, the way we set this up. It looks really nice. It's on a site called uh, iPoster. And uh, we're going to open up the Zoom meeting. And if you have 5.3 or above and you sign in, as I've told you about earlier, you have to do both those things. Uh, you can hop between the Zoom rooms and uh, have a look at uh, each of these students' posters, ask them questions, and then we're going to ask you to judge the competition at the end. Uh, so here is a screen grab of the YouTube sites. The first time we've tried to do this, and I think it's working out pretty well. We've got more subscribers than when I did the screen grab the other day, which is great. A lot of people viewing. If you view it and have a bunch of questions later on, please ask them. Uh, the individual speakers will certainly get back to you on those questions. So here are the three, the technical groups in the middle, and then international liaisons, that's for tomorrow morning on the right. And then uh, more on the AI machine learning roundtable in a minute, that's for, for Wednesday morning. Here is the iPoster site. Uh, this is new for us as well. We've never done this before, but every student got their own account and could go in and build their poster. And it's pretty neat. If you click on one of those posters, you can look at it yourself. And uh, every one of those posters, uh, there's a little down arrow on it. You can click and it opens up the poster a little more. And so you can walk through each of those yourself, leave comments, uh, contact uh, the author if you like, but we're really hoping you sign on live tomorrow and uh, interact with them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, for those of you that are looking to hire students, there's no better way to uh, get to know these folks and uh, their capabilities, their background, than talking to them uh, like this. So we've got, uh, I think, 21 of them. So a lot of uh, opportunities and a lot of variability for you guys to choose from. And I just sent out about a couple hours ago an email to all registrants that are not part of Penn State, along with some more instructions, the Zoom 5.3 thing, make sure you sign on thing, and also a link to the judging uh, page that we set up. So it just asks for your name, your organization, and then there's a one to 10 ranking for every single poster. You don't have to look at them all. You can just look at the ones you care about. And what's gonna happen in the Zoom meeting is we're just gonna run through these one by one, and every student gets to give a two minute elevator speech to try to give you some quick background, a quick highlight, and to entice you to go to their poster breakout room. Some of these students are on the home stretch. We'll be done with them next year. And if you have signed on to the CVent site, you should have access to those resumes. Uh, if you're having trouble signing on to the CVent site, just uh, drop uh, Kelly an email. Uh, it should be straightforward. You just need your registration code if you've lost it. Just uh, try to sign in click forgot my registration code, enter your email address, and it'll email it right to you. And all you got to do is enter it and you're in. Uh, you can also, along with the student uh, resumes, there is a special page we set up that has not all the participants, but I'd say maybe about two thirds of them. Uh, not everybody wanted their name and contact information shared, but a lot of people uh, said that was fine. So if you want to connect with somebody else from another company, organization, whatever, um, just have a look on that uh, page and you should be able to connect with them. And then the final item on the agenda, it's common at the end of the CV work, workshop to have a short course on some sort of a topic of interest. We really didn't want to do that this year, all virtual. And so we decided to do instead is pick a hot topic. And I think you can agree this is certainly one of those, uh, but just kind of do a round table instead. So one of the things that uh, I have been noticing and others have been noticing is that there's just more and more going on in artificial intelligence and machine learning in the research that we see not only happening at Penn State, but elsewhere. Uh, technical conferences, uh, other workshops, it's just becoming a, obviously a big thing. It's certainly outside of vibration acoustics as well. So we figured it made sense to get folks together 
And we've got a nice collection of people from inside and outside Penn State, from academia and industry, as well as uh, one of our, two of our international liaisons are participating as well. So we've got a global perspective on this topic. And the presentations are all over the place, but uh, there is some commonality there. And what Carl and Danny are going to try to do, they're our moderators, is um, everybody's going to get a few minutes to give highlights again. And the idea is you pre-watch the recordings ahead of time. We'll address some questions and then just have an open discussion. And there's a few seed uh, topics that Carl and Danning have come up with, but we can certainly go outside that box. Uh, the round table set up for a couple hours, but if we go long, that's absolutely fine. The whole intent of this is to get some discussion going, find out what you, the out, um, people outside Penn State are actually interested in, and maybe better focus, up, focus us here at Penn State on where we should be going in this uh, topic. And one of the questions we're gonna ask is, is this a new CEV technical group going forward? So uh, stay tuned for a, a snap poll question on that during the round table. Uh, I sure hope this is our last year doing this. Um, next year's workshop is currently scheduled for around the same time, 19th through 21st of October. Uh, those of you that have been to workshops before knew we were getting a little bit cramped in our old venue and we're excited to be moving over to the hub. That was supposed to happen right now. Uh, but we're going to be in their biggest uh, room, the Heritage Hall. And once again, I think uh, if nothing else, uh, this COVID thing has made us realize maybe it's time to start going toward online access for all these things going forward, just to get more people involved. Uh, I'm hoping that a lot of people come in person. Uh, for those that can't, we want to make sure that uh, a lot of other people can uh, experience the workshop also. So that's my overview. We can actually stop and uh, maybe take a few questions if there are any. And then uh, the next step is uh, go through our eight groups, hopefully limit people to five minute overviews, but I know faculty members can get excited about their work. So if we go over these two hours, uh, that's fine. We'll stay on as long as it takes. So before we move on to that, uh, any questions about uh, my general overview? Okay then, so what I'm gonna do is stop sharing and then mute my mic. That's another thing I'll ask everybody to do. If you're not uh, on, uh, please mute your mic. But uh, next up is uh, Dr. Sparrow again, and he will give you an introduction to the Propagation and Radiation Group. And he, along with some others, have some guest stars. You may have noticed that in the pre-recorded uh, videos. It wasn't just all the group heads all the time. And so all the guest stars I think should be on. So if you have questions about their parts, uh, they can address them as well. So Vic, please take it away. So Steve, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me again. Before I get going on that, I did want to have two orders of business. Number one, when people do want to ask questions, Steve, how do they and how do they ask the questions? Do they type it into the chat? Use their microphones? How do you want it to happen? And I'm hoping you heard me. Yes, I did, but I was busy moving around on the screen and had the damn microphone muted. <laughs> so okay. anything yeah. goes. If they want to type in chat, uh, just keep an eye out for it. If you don't see the chat as a group head, uh, Kelly and I'll be monitoring, so we'll let you know. Uh, but a microphone is fine as well. Anything goes. This is okay, new ground great. here. So. Great. I just have the way I've logged in, I haven't seen any chat yet. So uh, the other piece, I'll just want to say on behalf of everybody, thank you, Steve. This has been a Herculean task. Uh, I know you've had help from conferences and institutes, but thank you for all the great work you've done putting this workshop together. Please join me all and let's thank Steve for the great job that he's he's done. And with that, I'll go ahead and just talk a little bit about uh, the propagation and radiation group. And uh, I'm going to try to bring up some slides and try to show my screen. Just give me a moment and I should be able to do that, I believe. So just give me a moment. Again, this is what often takes a long time. Alrighty, and hopefully you're seeing my screen now. And hopefully you're going to see my slides in full screen in just a moment. 
So again, for those of you who have had the opportunity already to look at the short video we made for the Propagation and Radiation Group, uh, thank you very much. If you haven't seen it, I'm about to give you the quick pre of what's in that video. Again, some of the faculty members who are affiliated with the Propagation and Radiation Group, we focused um, on two of the faculty uh, as well as myself this year. Again, uh, we're not doing justice to all the great work going on by all the graduate students. Again, here's a list of some of the people involved with the Propagation and Radiation Group. Um, as you are uh, already made aware, there is a uh, tour of the ARIS facility by Dr. Vijan and some of the research projects that are going on. So we'll mention that again. Uh, Dr. Steve Thompson uh, talks in our video a little bit about the moving coil modeling. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, the Sonic Bat project. And for those of you who haven't watched the video, I'll give you a pre about what that's about. Um, so Dr. Vijan's work is related to uh, quantifying human response to acoustics. And if you want to learn more about that scheduled for tomorrow, please take the virtual tour. I think you'll find it very interesting. Um, and uh, she'll be available to answer any quick questions which might come up about that in, in just a few moments. Uh, also, as I said, Dr. Steve Thompson, who's on, uh, has been doing a lot over the years with uh, transducers, transducer modeling. Here he's talking a little bit about moving coil modeling and um, they do analysis, but they also do measurements. And uh, here's an example of doing that, making the measurements with a uh, clipple measurement system. So if you have questions for Steve, uh, we can take those. Uh, again, in the sonic bat portion of that uh, modeling, I'm mostly doing outdoor sound modeling. Here, what we're looking at, for those who haven't had a chance to see the video yet, is we're looking, this is a box of the atmosphere and saying that a sonic boom wave comes in from on top and it propagates through this box. The box is filled with atmospheric turbulence. And we look to see how the signatures that is the sound you would hear, pressure versus time, change as you go through the atmospheric turbulence. And this is to recreate what actually happens in the uh, atmosphere. Uh, we developed a um, algorithm uh, which we can be used to predict the effects of turbulence on sonic boom signatures. And uh, I'm just showing you the final result right here. Uh, right here, you're seeing uh, this is deviation from some nominal sound level and whether the sound level we use perceived level is above or below the nominal value and the, what's the probability density. And so this is probably the best data I will ever have in my professional career we had where we did a number of simulations and we found when people actually flew supersonic aircraft and made measurements on the ground, there is a wonderful agreement between the measurements and simulated uh, data. Again, this was with no free parameters. We took the uh, atmospheric and weather data from uh, the measurements. But other than that, uh, it was amazing to see the agreement between uh, simulation and measurement for that case. If you're interested in knowing more, please take a look at the video. So what we'll do now is just see if anybody has any questions on uh, these projects that are going on. I'll also uh, mention that I'm teaching the computational acoustics class uh, this current fall semester. Uh, we're teaching both uh, the uh, Actran software as well as the Comsol software. Um, so if anybody has any questions about that, I'd take those as well. Uh, so do we have any questions on either of these projects? First of all, we'll start uh, with Dr. Vijan, did anyone ask, want to ask Dr. Vijan any questions at this time? And Steve, you'll have to monitor the chat for me because I'm not seeing it. Okay, and we'll also uh, say if anyone wants to speak up and ask any questions to Dr. Steve Thompson uh, about the acoustic transducers and uh, measurements or a moving coil. Any questions on those?
Okay. And uh, any questions back to the Sonic Bat project, any of the propagation aspects of propagation through atmospheric turbulence? Does anyone have any questions on that or any other related topics? Hey, Vic, this is Gary Cooper, and I, I do have to have a question for you here. Hi, Gary. Great to hear from you. Yeah. Hey, can you remind us uh, on your on your quiet sonic boom uh, aircraft, what is unique about its design that makes it quieter than, say, the Concorde used to be? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So the idea uh, is that American uh, airframers would like to start building aircraft that they can fly over land. So the way it works is that they actually shape the geometry of the aircraft. The geometry is precisely controlled so that when it flies supersonically and it makes a shock, the shocks don't build up on top of each other, they smooth out. And when the sound propagates through the atmosphere, you get a nice smooth kind of wave instead of an abrupt end wave. And uh, that's been proven. It's um, uh, in wind tunnels and things like that. NASA right now is building a demonstration aircraft called the X-59. This is with US taxpayer dollars, which will uh, be rolled out next year and fly a year after that. And so they're gonna demonstrate this by flying it over test sites and eventually over communities uh, to verify how quiet it is. So uh, yeah, that's, that's how they do it. It's by carefully shaping the geometry of the aircraft, Gary. Thanks for asking. Well, thanks. Thank you. Very good. Thank, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hey, Vic, this is uh, Steve. There was actually, a, to me anyway, a pretty alarming contour that you had in your brief that just showed that uh, what happens on the ground, at least to an end wave, at, uh, when it propagates through turbulence, and in some locations on the ground, you can get this focusing effect and this big amplification. It's, it's, it's simply when the sound waves um, go through an area where the speed of sound is higher or lower, the waves sort of converge. And so it's like a little focusing of the sound. And whenever you have a shock and you're focusing the shock, you can get a spike. So we don't like that. That makes things very loud. And what's so nice about the newly proposed um, shaped sonic boom aircraft, uh, it will be very difficult to create that. So the opportunity to make those real strong, loud occurrences is almost negligible now. So just this, I don't know if you can bring up the plot or not. Uh, I think it was a couple after this. Yeah, I don't, I, I can find that. It'll oh, take that's okay. That's okay. Up. Yeah. But anyway, it just, it made me wonder, I know regulators, I work with regulators. Uh, are they going to see stuff like that and say, we're just applying a, a factor of whatever penalty function on anything because this focusing can't happen and how, how high is the bar to convince them that they shouldn't be doing that? Maybe that's not a question for you. It's maybe more for the FAA, but. Right. Well, just to reply, and I'm not going to reply as FAA would, but my understanding, both for NASA, all the data that NASA is trying to obtain with their X-59 demonstrator and the other numerical simulations myself and other people are working on is to provide evidence for the international regulators. So yeah, they set a very high bar. They're, you know, want to be very sure before people would start hearing these sounds that they uh, would be okay for people to hear and not jarring and alarming. So yes, uh, there's quite a bit of work going in just into providing evidence for the regulators. Okay, well again, thanks for the opportunity to talk about these different things. Again, uh, if people do have specific questions and things like that, they're certainly welcome uh, to contact me directly and I can get you in touch with the other people if, if, if it's, it's not directed toward me. So again, I hope everybody has a wonderful workshop. I'll be ducking in and out of some of the other discussions uh, throughout the couple days, but guys, we're so glad everybody can participate. Thanks again. I'll stop sharing now, Steve. All right, excellent. Thank you, Vic, Michelle, and Steve. Mandy, you're up next. If you could bring up your short and brief Yes, hi, um, good afternoon, everybody. Okay, give me a second.
All right, I'm gonna move a couple things around. So we've got, okay. All right, uh, thank you, Steve, for organizing all of this. Um, it's really great to see so many, so many people online. Um, I'm Amanda Hanford. I am the CAV group lead for acoustic materials and, and metamaterials. Um, so, so I work at the Applied Research Lab in the Acoustics Division, as well as I'm a member of the graduate faculty in the Acoustics Program at Penn State. Uh, so I wanted just to, to start off by kind of giving a, a general overview of the research that goes on in, within this group. Um, basically anything regarding acoustic materials, right? So we either design a material for acoustic benefit or we use acoustics to understand what's going on uh, with the material. Uh, so, so we kind of look at both of those perspectives, uh, you know, so ranging from uh, using acoustics to do material characterization to designing our acoustic materials for interesting, for interesting applications. We're also really interested in manufacturing techniques with the, um, with the, with the addition of additive manufacturing as, uh, as part of our you know, new, new and exciting technologies and materials, we can do some really interesting things, not just geometrically, but also you know, it, using different kinds of materials. And so it's, um, it's, 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 it's expanded our, 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 our portfolio, if you will, of what we can do with, with materials for, 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 you know, with acoustics. So we're, we're really interested in different manufacturing techniques. We work with a lot of people uh, at Penn State um, from the Materials Research Institute, as well as, you know, at, at the Applied Research Lab, we work with uh, the materials people there. Um, the SIMP 3D is a really great facility for doing additive manufacturing. So we work uh, quite a bit with them as well. Uh, as I mentioned, we do a lot of work in different applications and some of those, some of those different applications for uh, acoustic materials would include things like acoustic cloaking. I think we've talked about that um, in previous CIV seminars, um, as well as uh, using inverse design methods to, to develop you know, what, what, what we'll call metamaterials. Uh, so you, know, you give us a design criteria and we can design a material um, in theory, we can des design a material that can that can meet those objectives. So active metamaterials is also a research area of interest right now. And then, okay, okay all of those um, also relate to structural vibration control. Um, so we look at the structures as well as uh, for structural control, as well as acoustic, you know, uh, airborne, or, you know, fluid borne acoustics as well. So and, and all the coupling between all of those things. Um, so I, I think um, this, is, this is also in my recorded, recorded talk as well, but I just wanted to give a big shout out to a couple of new members of our, grad, our, our faculty who are doing work in the area of acoustic materials and metamaterials. So Yung Jing is an, a faculty member in the acoustics program and uh, Ryan Harn is a mechanical engineering professor here at Penn State. So, you know, they brought a bunch of their students with them to Penn State, as well as all the existing uh, faculty members in a variety of different departments across the university. Uh, so in our pre-recorded talk, uh, both Dr. Harn and Dr. Jing uh, gave us an overview of the different kinds of work that they're doing uh, within their specific uh, research areas. Uh, so, you know, um, if we have any questions specifically to them, we can, we can touch base with them um, in a minute. Um, so I just wanted to pull out a, a select group of papers and presentations from people uh, within the Penn State organization, a lot of different uh, papers on mat materials and metamaterials. Um, and we had a couple of uh, really great uh, student, student uh, awards as well. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of share that, share that wonderful news with you. Um, so I, I think that's all I really had, at least for right now. I didn't really want to go too much further because I wanted to leave time for questions. Um, you know, if, especially if you have questions for any of our, uh, or for, for our, our members as uh, our, our new faculty members. Uh, so um, yeah, I guess, are there any questions? Let's see, monitor. 
monitor things here. Amanda, this is Gary Koopman again. Um, how close are, are you to okay, getting, say, commercialization on, say, like the one you uh, mentioned, the low, low frequency broadband attenuator, the materials that uh, show this feature? How close to commercialization, com commercialization are you on these things? Any idea? That's a good question. I mean, I think, um, when was it, Steve? We had a, as part of the CAV workshop, maybe maybe a year or two ago, we did have a roundtable discussion about that very thing, right? Uh, you know, it's all great, all of the, the, the academic work that we're doing right now, um, but ultimately we need to transition that to industry. So, I mean, I think, and, and I think the problem is, Dr. Hooven, is that most of the, the work in metamaterials is pretty specific to the application, right? Uh, so maybe you're interested in low frequency, but um, small, small area, for example, or maybe you're interested in broadband. And those are gonna require different metamaterial um, uh, concepts. So I, I think we, we do have to, we have, do have to realize that limitation, but in the grand scheme of things, I mean, I think some of these things are already being used, right? I, I mean, I guess uh, there's, there's some, some, some application spaces that are using, using this kinds of concept and materials. And of course, this also comes back to what is the actual definition of a metamaterial. I mean, people have been using things like uh, perforated liners in, in aircraft engines for a long time. And in, in some certain areas, you know, you could, you could actually define a metamaterial to be just that. Um, so, so I think it, it kind of depends a little bit on that as well. But I mean, I think in some areas, uh, we are seeing, seeing that, that move, move to, uh, manufacturing, uh, now, right. So I, but, but again, it depends on the application. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in or have a qualifier or or a follow-up comment there, but that's my interpretation of that anyway. Yeah, this is Steve. Any of our corporate sponsors just have any thoughts on um, what's holding you back from using them or are you actively using them or? Yeah, I know it's always tough to get these things started on Zoom, but uh, I'm going to try. <laughs> right, it's the the Zoom the Zoom like um, mute mute. Uh, yeah, agreed. <laughs> All right, I'm going to start scrolling down to participants and see if I can find uh, somebody that will talk to us. Um, Kristen at NNL, you're always good to call on. What what are you guys thinking about? If you're allowed to tell me. Uh, about uh, metamaterials and in, in your community and navy reactors and piping and pumps and things like that. Is there any interest in it? Just too heavy a lift? Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, we we are looking at it from just like a developmental fundamental technology perspective. Um, and so, you know, we we've made our own samples with 3D printing and things like that. And we've been uh, we've been doing studies and in, in heating tubes and and just real fundamental type exploration work uh, to see how we could apply that to our applications. Um, so there's some different ideas that people have, and there's some sort of bench testing that that we've done, um, but we haven't, um, you know, really gone beyond that. Right. That's probably all I can say. Um, I. I do understand though, um, Dr. Hanford's point about, you know, a lot of things could be taken as a meta material. Um, and so that kind of really expands a lot of our thinking in terms of, well, you know, can you use uh, this type of technology for liners and, and other things that don't necessarily have to look exactly like what you see in um, a lot of, you know, airborne type applications, can you do it for for things with heavier fluids and in structures that are highly coupled. And so those are the kinds of things that really kind of go beyond, um, I think some of the more uh, studied applications out there. Yeah, right, I just, okay. yeah go ahead, Mandy, sorry. I, oh, I was just gonna also kind of follow on that, that thread there, right? I know 
I know Steve, you had brought up the acoustic black holes as, as a, a research area that you know we're, we're involved in in a lot of different fronts. I mean, if you if you really think about what the definition of a metamaterial is, and we didn't talk about it to, right now, but in my video, we talk a little bit about it. You could call an acoustic black hole a form of a metamaterial, right? So uh, usually what we think of when, we, when we're talking about a metamaterial is um, you know, any one individual small scale feature is gonna behave differently when you consider it as a homogenized material. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's right. There's lots of different ways you can define a metamaterial, so, but yeah. All right, so I'm gonna ask the question I always ask metamaterials folks, and I probably have asked a previous CV workshops. And invariably, when you look at these briefs, um, most of them assume like unit cell theory and this perfect periodicity throughout. Practically, what happens when the manufacturing process or the materials keep that from happening? So every cell is a little bit different some way or another. Or just after a couple of years of in-service life, things get gunked up, the front end of something gets coated with a bunch of particulate. What happens then? How, are we, how is the community starting to address the robustness of the performance of some of these uh, concepts? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. And it's actually too bad we don't have the international liaisons on this call in particular, because I know that I remember hearing from the, the KU Leuven people at one point or another, I think they did a study on that, you know, like if if you if you have a damage of like some percentage of your your unit cells, how much the performance would degrade. And there have been a couple of, of studies in that area. And I think you still get a reasonable performance even with degradation of some of your unit cells. Um, and of course, there's some, some quantification of that, but I, and I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, but I do know people are looking at that. Um, so let's see, is that everything that I was gonna say on that topic? Um, yeah, and then the other issues too, you know, infinite periodicity, uh, you know, you can't, you, you don't, your applications never have infinite periodicity. Uh, you have to, man, you have to have an end cap somewhere, right? Or, or there has to be an end and yeah, your, your performance is going to degrade there as well. Um, and you, you can see that even in some of the experimental results that you see in the literature. And I get, and again, it just points to like how, how sensitive is your system to, you know, those slight degradations. Um, so yeah, I guess I guess that's the bottom line. So. Yeah, it was a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. All right. Anybody else? Any questions for our guest um, speakers? I don't actually know. I think Yung Jing is on, but I'm not sure if Dr. Harn is on. Um, but does anyone have any questions specific to them? We we are really excited that they have joined us here at Penn State within the last. A uh, couple months, and we will be um, hosting them as CV seminars. You know, to get a little bit more into the technical depth of their of their work. We're excited to do a lot of collaboration. But any questions for any of those guys? Okay, Steve. I guess I'm handing it back to you then. All right. Thank you, Mandy. Next up, we have uh, Ed Smith, who runs our Vertical Lift Research Center of Excellence and also the Rotorcraft Acoustics and Dynamics groups of the CV. Ed, are you with us? I am. Ed has one of the all-time great offices, by the way. You can just get a little feel for it by looking behind. All these amazing little rotorcraft models and things. Uh, let's see. All right, I think we're good to go. Can I get a thumbs up, Steve? You need to swap views. So go up on the upper left and um, right now you're, you're looking at the speaker view. Ah, uh, the speaker view. Yeah, you wanna do swap views or something like that. 
Some hmm. on the upper left of your screen. That looks it. How about there you go. That? Perfect. You're good. All right. Well, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, good to be back here in front of you uh, as best we can here. Uh, I'm going to just take a few minutes and go over some of the projects that we're involved with. Uh, the uh, rotorcraft, uh, of course, is uh, any vehicle that uses rotating wings uh, to generate their lift and propulsion and control. So we're seeing a lot of activity continuing in the conventional helicopter realm, as well as tilt rotors, things like the uh, V-22 Osprey and the uh, V-280 or other, other vehicles that are smaller than the Osprey uh, that are in that tilt rotor configuration. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of urban air mobility or advanced air mobility uh, vehicles being explored with uh, a few billion dollars actually of venture capital coming in from all over the place to uh, a number of startup companies and large companies so we'll talk about that uh, for a few minutes uh, this, this afternoon. Uh, the group members, uh, we've, we've had several different people involved uh, because basically rotorcraft dynamics spans a pretty wide frequency range. Uh, we have uh, uh, Joe Horn uh, and his colleagues, his students working on the flight dynamics uh, part of rotorcraft dynamics and also on uh, merging the flight dynamics with the vibration and loads control. Uh, Ken Brentner, uh, many of you have met in the past, and Jose Palacios, uh, we'll, we'll hear from Jose uh, about kind of overlaps between rotary wing applications and adaptive structures. Uh, Ken Brentner works very extensively in rotor noise prediction, so he is a uh, hot commodity these days with all of these urban mobility vehicles uh, wanting to know uh, what the acoustical footprint might be of having many different vehicles flying around at low altitude, say 3000 feet and below. Uh, so he's, he's trying to keep, keep on top of all the demand with his students. Uh, a number of other faculty in the middle there, Steve Conlon, many of you know, Chris Ron, from mechanical, Chuck Bakus and I working on uh, material solutions for increasing the damping of rotor blades. So I'll, I'll hit on some of these uh, in, the, in a couple of minutes here. I do wanna highlight uh, Eric Greenwood for a moment. Uh, so Eric is our newest faculty member uh, here in the aero department. He's one of several that we hired last fall, but we're particularly excited uh, in this CAV group uh, about Eric joining us because he has spent uh, the better part of the last 15 years developing his expertise in uh, rotorcraft acoustics and rotor noise uh, programs, uh, both as a PhD student down at University of Maryland in their helicopter or rotorcraft program, and then after that for about 10 years at NASA Langley in the aeroacoustics branch. Uh, so he comes and joins us and uh, works on a combination of experimental work uh, and analytical work. Uh, you can read a little bit of his description and uh, hopefully meet Eric uh, in years to come. He already has kind of a vibrant uh, program building with four or five graduate students and uh, his hands are, are busy, but I'm sure he's got a lot of energy and would like to uh, talk with any of you through the CAV. So hearty welcome to Eric Greenwood uh, in the Aero Department. Uh, we have uh, a number of graduate students uh, supported in rotorcraft here at Penn State. There are probably about 40 of them. Uh, now they are working on a variety of different programs, uh, different projects ranging from aerodynamics to structures to gears uh, flight simulation, autonomy, and so forth. So I tried to pick out the ones who were really affiliated with our uh, Center for Acoustics and Vibration. Right? So these uh, thesis topics are things uh, that are related to acoustics and vibration that are motivated by needs in the uh, helicopter community, if you will. Uh, we'll be highlighting uh, one of those uh, 
particularly fast moving and interesting projects. Uh, our, our student Raja uh, recorded and did a very nice job of his uh, presentation on uh, asymmetric rotors um, and uh, some of them being coaxial, but even some of them being conventional rotors with uh, unusual trailing edges. Uh, so this gives you a range of topics that uh, we're working on and uh, some points of contact within the faculty for you to uh, follow up. Uh, we've also graduated quite a number of students in the last uh, year. Uh, so some of these students uh, and their thesis topics uh, you've heard from in the last few years uh, here on campus, uh, shaft balancing, uh, rotor blade uh, vibration and damping control with uh, flexible matrix composite devices, uh, pericyclic, so gearboxes uh, with a low, lower acoustic footprint and a high uh, power uh, ratio, uh, power to volume ratio, right? uh, load limiting flight control from Umberto Sieri. We had a poster last year that was very popular with, uh, with the team. Right, so we've, we've had a number of students graduate, which we're very pleased about uh, trying to keep tabs on them. Uh, this gives you some idea uh, of a uh, little bit more idea of uh, some of the Rotorcraft Center projects that we've been working on the last five years that are related to noise and vibration. So the first one up there is uh, flow behind a hub uh, structure. Uh, so the hub of the rotor blades are not very aerodynamic. You can see uh, sometimes the uh, coaxial hubs on the right there. Uh, it's uh, like having uh, large fairings and uh, large, uh, not very aerodynamic looking structures in the flow that results in wake separation, uh, which behind the hub, which then uh, shakes the aft part of the fuselage. So we've been working on that. Uh, using our water tunnel uh, here at Penn State to evaluate high Reynolds number unsteady flow fields and uh, collaborating with some of our CFD uh, partners, uh, University of Tennessee to simulate that and be able to predict uh, more of the vibration, not such so much the noise uh, behind that flow field. Uh, Ken Brentner uh, has been looking with his students at the aeroacoustics of coaxial rotors uh, so if you picture the blades coming off of the hub, uh, counter-rotating, uh, sometimes co-rotating. Uh, so there are a lot of different uh, blade passage effects and interactional aerodynamics effects that Ken and his students have been studying the last four years. A coaxial rotor basically gives you a potential for higher speed uh, in a helicopter. Uh, compared, compared to a conventional rotor. So some of the programs you might see around the country uh, are from Sikorsky and Boeing. Uh, there are programs, uh, products called X2 technology, which is coaxial rotors in the 20, 21st century here. Uh, you've been uh, briefed a couple of times on both of these projects in recent years. Uh, so we've been trying to put uh, energy dissipation into rotor blades uh, when they rotate in the plane of rotation. So a rotor blade is a very flexible uh, structure, unlike a propeller blade uh, or a jet engine gas turbine blade, the blades are flexible uh, up and down out of the plane of rotation, in the plane of rotation, and they change their pitch as they go around the azimuth. Right? So that damping is needed in the plane of rotation is called leading and lagging, right? So the blades flap up and down. They also flex in the plane of rotation and that's a very lightly damped mode. So we've been looking at using uh, nano reinforced composites, uh, interlayers basically of uh, highly concentrated uh, nano yarns uh, to uh, create high damping uh, out of a very lightweight structure trying to integrate that into the blade. I mentioned the pericyclic transmission. Uh, we've got some uh, progress where we're building a 50 horsepower prototype. You can see the gears are made on the right by a uh, specialty company called Gleason uh, up in New York State. 
in Rochester. So we're getting ready to uh, be able to finally test these uh, configurations after about 10 years worth of analysis and design. So we're excited about that. Uh, Cliff continues to work in the Rotocraft Center. Cliff listened in and his students on uh, ultrasonic diagnostics, laser ultrasonic diagnostics for in situ manufacturing, monitoring, and process and quality monitoring of uh, additively manufactured parts. It was great interest in the helicopter community and the Army community in learning more about this subject. So, Cliff has been working on that the last several years. And uh, just Finishing up here with Ken Brentner's task. They're trying to uh, develop rapid prediction techniques, uh, usually for acoustics, for aeroacoustics. Uh, usually the aeroacoustics comes in rather late in the design process. And uh, where there's not a whole lot that can be done other than measure it and try and develop uh, operational procedures to mitigate it. So uh, the Army and Navy and the civil community is trying to trying to uh, come up with some techniques where they can model the rotor noise um, quicker and earlier in the design process. So Ken is getting a lot of attention, as I was saying, in the urban mobility arena with that. Uh, these, I won't brief these, but this is more for your reference. Uh, some other ongoing noise and vibration projects uh, from the FAA, uh, from the Army, so forth. Uh, this is a nice project that only touches on noise and vibration a little bit in the, in the aspects of vibration control, but you might have seen this uh, on the Big Ten TV network or on Penn State marketing uh, videos uh, where a team of our faculty has been involved very heavily in the design of a uh, UAV about the size of a small car. So a drone about the size of a small car uh, that is part of an interplanetary exploration mission uh, that will be sent to Titan, which is a moon of Saturn, the largest moon of Saturn. Uh, it's a very, very ambitious uh, program. Uh, they're trying to fly a small drone on Mars just in a couple of years. You might've heard about that one. Uh, this one is a much larger scale vehicle and uh, represents all of the scientific payload. You can see that it would come down on a parachute after deploying from an aero shell. And then once it's down on the surface, it would operate for several years, uh, something on the order of 40 or 50 missions uh, exploring the surface of Titan. So very, very challenging. Johns Hopkins University is the lead there and uh, we're supporting them. Uh, we're not really worrying about acoustics as you can imagine there, but it's really uh, quite the vibration environment. Uh, if there are any questions on uh, Raja's presentation on uh, anti-phase asymmetric rotors, Raja is on board here. I see him from the lab. Um, sharing his screen there. Uh, that's, that's the mode of operation for our graduate students these days uh, in the lab. So if you have questions on that, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let Raja here field them. Great. That's all Thanks, I Ed. have, Steve. Yep. Thanks, Ed. Any uh, questions on the overview or Raja's uh, brief, which is also on the YouTube site? So Ed, where are we going at uh, Penn State on drone noise? I know that uh, Jose's got some stuff going on in that, which may or may not come up later. Mm -hmm. I think Eric Green was doing some stuff, Tim Bringard. Can you give us just a quick thumbnail on where we're taking this, this kind of hot topic of drone noise at Penn State? Uh, a lot of it is in the experimental arena. We're trying to get data for validating uh, I would say not just codes, but new ideas on controlling the noise of these, uh, you know, the drones that we're pretty much talking about usually have multiple rotors interacting with each other. Uh, sometimes the blades themselves interact with each other in the sense that the rotors are stacked or coaxial or co-rotating. 
right? So there's a lot of interest in trying to uh, reduce the noise with some innovative concepts that may not be ready for prime time on a large scale 20,000 pound helicopter, uh, but might be uh, achievable on these smaller vehicles. Uh, generally, the RPM is very high, you know, compared to a large vehicle with a large radius and a relatively low uh, rotation speed. So they're electric powered, so it gives us some opportunity to uh, go after uh, noise control that we wouldn't ordinarily be able to, you know, to really um, realize on a large, heavy helicopter. Yep. And just a heads up, we actually had considered doing a uh, drone noise short course this year, but uh, that got uh, pushed aside. So that may be on the agenda for next year, depending on interest. So if anybody's interested in something like that, uh, please let us know. All right, great. Thank you, Ed. If you'd uh, drop your screen share, Mike uh, Johnson should be next with the Flow Noise Group. And I believe he does have a little highlight on some quadcopter noise reduction as part of his talk. So Mike, are you with us? Mike Johnson, you around? Yeah, I'm, I'm here, Steve. I'm just getting trying to figure this out here. So okay, yeah, no worries. Using a different a different computer. Hope this works. So let's see, share screen. Let's see. Well, I'll, hmm. Hmm. all right. Oh, it's, it's, I'm sorry about this. So I'll, I'll go just verbally talk about what I did. So does everybody hear me okay? So I should have tried it. All right. Um, so um, um, my group, um, uh, we have, um, uh, it's a flow induced uh, noise group. Um, um, uh, you see, get, let me get, at least you can look at me. So let me bring that up. Okay, so um, my uh, my group is a flow-induced uh, noise group. Um, I have a, a large group of, of people. There's, uh, uh, there's about uh, 25 of them, and uh, we we went through. Um, uh, we have a combination of uh, computational fluid dynamics uh, measurements. Um, we had a lot of flow um, uh, stuff as far as pipes and and also in in uh, in some rotorcraft as well. So uh, in my in my presentation, um, I went through and uh, talked about a variety of different different areas. So th thanks, Steve. So um, you can see the the group here um, uh, is is there. So these are my assessment of which which the groups are. There's a combination of comp computational and flow. And, uh, and there's, uh, we have a couple of uh, jet noise ones as well. And you can see the different groups. Um, they consist mainly of ARL and so forth. So um, the topics are, um, that the, the we went through on the video were regarding um, um, two big areas. The, the, the big areas that we emphasized uh, this year was um, pipe flows. Um, and the reason pipe flows are important is to understand uh, what's going on with um, you know the flow field and how it interacts with the with the uh, with the with the turbo machinery and and the like to get to get the kind of response for that. Um, the other area is is was in the area of quadcopters and so forth, where we were looking at the variety of different different um, ideas for 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 doing that. Um, so there are some other areas, and um, uh, Ken Bretner usually provides a lot of material for me. And in this particular case, he's there. The students are going for the big bucks, so they're going to be presenting at the at the student uh, competition um, um, tomorrow um, for that. So um, that's that's what, what's going on with that particular area. Um, so if you can go um, a little bit more, Steve. So um, so here's a couple of cases where we you know we looked at. You know the noise uh, from going um, with and without uh, looking at weight and so forth on on different um, uh, turbo machinery in order to figure out what's what's going on with that. And then um, the the next area was uh, um, um, was go back go back a little bit. 
this is kind of uh, different stuff um, there with this one right here you have there this is one case where we were looking at a quadcopter consisting of of uh, cross flow turbine uh, designs as you can see that moved around through the through the flow and, and went to different maneuvers and so forth so that was was a, a theme too that we covered in, in, a, in a talk so um, so I, I think I'll just leave it at that and then if there's any questions I can go ahead and answer ask answer any questions that you have you want to talk about uh, Margalit's work here with the uh, turbines? Yeah, sure. Um, so we have um, uh, here was a, a cross flow turbine. So it's kind of like paddle wheels um, that go around, and uh, it's th there's an advantage with these is there that the, the main goal for these things was to generate um, power. So as a way of uh, having it sit and make power, and then f fly around to where it needs to go. So in this particular case, we have these different um, uh, phasings of the different turbines because you have four of them. We were, uh, 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 Margaret Goldschmidt looked at how she would go ahead and, and uh, uh, adjust the phasing between the different or clocking between the different turbines to, to figure out how much uh, to reduce the amount of radiated sound because this is, uh, the blades are straight so they tend to um, uh, hit the fluid uh, more, more um, uh, 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 at, at one time and caused a lot of vibration and noise. So we wanted to see if we can do anything about adjusting it. And she was very successful in being able to, to do that kind of uh, thing here. So this kind of shows some of the results from her, her test from doing that. So that's kind of in essence what was, what was shown during the video. So is there any other, any other questions that anybody had? Hello and welcome to my talk. talk about Adam's work real quick or? Sure. Adam, are you there? Yeah, Adam, I don't know if, if you are there, if you can give a one minute elevator speech. This is pretty cool, doing a tomographic uh, PIV of a uh, flow. I see he's, he's, he is logged on. So just unmute yourself, Adam, and you can talk. If he's not there, I'm going to jump to the very end because this is really neat. Um, you guys, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep, go ahead. I'm just going to turn your very last slide on the play because you got this great animation. So if you can give us like a one minute thing on here. Yeah, so at a, at a high level here, we performed some tomographic PIV measurements in a pipe flow. We had a, a cylinder across this pipe to kind of provide an easy um, uh, sound source or, or a source of... Uh, vibration for our flow. And uh, what we used was a, a modal decomposition technique called spectral proper th orthogonal decomposition to uh, pull out the uh, velocity motions related to the, the shedding that was due to this uh, flow over a cylinder. And we related that to the differential pressure across the cylinder. And uh, as you can see on the slide, we have raw measurements on the left and our reconstruction on the right. Um, with this reconstruction on the right, uh, um, consisting of the parts of the velocity field related to this um, uh, shedding frequency or shedding phenomena that we uh, uh, found in this um, differential pressure sensor. So basically what this goes towards is um, connecting a uh, measurement of some sort of sound or vibration signal to um, parts of the velocity field that are related to that. So decomposing our velocity field to look for sources or contributors to sources of sound. Perfect. All right, so thanks for bearing with our technical difficulty, but I think we came through all right. Any questions from Mike or Adam? Steve, this is Gary again. I wanna address, we're gonna pick, uh, pick up where we left off on, on quadcopter noise and particularly for Mike there. Um, my feeling is, you know, I've been to several seminars of the National Academy of Engineering, had two days of quadcopter noise last year, last fall, and nobody seems to be making any great progress on, you know, any dramatic reductions. I'm wondering, are we just up against the wall of physics, kind of like the jet noise people? It's, you know, you get a dB here, a dB there. And I was wondering, Mike, on that, on that, um, Cross flow underwater project, you were using dipoles to cancel dipoles. Is it possible to 
do something re really novel with quadcopters and have the propellers begin to cancel their own sound, that kind of thing? Yeah, um, Gary, the, I would say, I mean, that would solve, you know, one or two blade rates, um, you know, one, you know, one blade passion free, so it'd be pretty low frequency that that would excite, but that would definitely help. I'm certain they can, they could do that. I don't, I don't know whether they have it. It's um, for, for a quadcopter, they're pretty far away, so they're not quite, uh, they would be in the acoustic far field, but they may or may not be, uh, you know, whether that would, you know, would cancel out completely, but that is something that could be tried. Uh, Tim Brungard is also part of the video. He looked a lot at, at you know, uh, changing blades and so forth. He didn't find much, much in help. He found out that, and he I presented this last year, he found out that having, making the rotors bigger and bigger was a big help. So in other words, you make them bigger, have them rotate a lot slower, and that tended to, to reduce the radiated noise. So you looked at, you know, a lot of manufacturers don't want to make them bigger, so they keep them the same. So you looked at blade numbers and so forth. And as the as the video showed, he didn't he didn't get much of a, an improvement from doing that. Um, but he did find that cutting down on the the weight of the of the you know the payload weight did help a lot. So that was kind of the, mm -hmm. kind of the bottom line for that point of view. But that's but, not surprising, is it? That's just kind of a given. We knew that beforehand, I think. Right. Mm -hmm. I noticed on Laura Zinger's, well, I guess it's going to, we'll talk about it tomorrow morning, but uh, Laura's was changing blade shapes, I think, and he didn't see much change either. So are we up against the physics wall? It's, it, it seems to be the case, sure. So it comes down to basically you got relative velocity and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. what, you know what, what it is, and you, know, you get a certain mm -hmm. amount of, you know, dipole noise from these particular types of um, mm -hmm. systems. So Amazon's going to be buzzing our neighborhoods for, for a long time. Right. <laughs> oh, dear. All right. Thank you very much, Mike. So uh, next up, we're going to go in a completely different direction. And uh, Julie Simon will give us an overview of the biomedical acoustics work going on. Awesome. Thanks. OK, so. My name is Julie Simon. I am the head of the Biomedical Acoustics Group and an assistant professor of acoustics and biomedical engineering. Uh, we're, I believe, the newest group. We were formed in 2018, and I'm joined by 10 other members across the uh, departments in Penn State pretty well. Uh, we have one ARL faculty, uh, some computer science and engineering, some mechanical engineering, some uh, engineering sciences mechanic, biomedical engineering. We have a lot of different uh, people that are involved in our group. Uh, we do everything from photoacoustic imaging to shear wave imaging, bubble monitoring, image processing, therapeutic developments, drug delivery, and we do modeling and experiments of all of the above. Uh, we're joined by our new faculty, Yun Jing, who's also in the Materials group. He does do some work in biomedical as well. And so, uh, we have a pretty good group going. Uh, so the overall goal of our group is to understand and apply acoustic principles to improve human health. And we come about it from a lot of different perspectives, um, which is part of what makes it so much fun is when we have all these different perspectives. Um, just as an update, we did have a seminar in the fall about CMUTs on glass substrates. We weren't able to do one in the spring and we are still looking to try to do one in the fall 2020, uh, but we'll see how that goes. We have three posters from our group, so I hope that you get a chance to do the poster session tomorrow. Uh, one on passive cavitation imaging, one on novel transparent ultrasound transducers, and another on ultrasound sensitive nanopeptisomes, or these phase change contrast agents that are really cool uh, for imaging deep vein thrombosis. We did have one student graduate, Molly Smallcomb received her MS degree. She's continuing on for her PhD, so she's still sticking around in the CAV and actually in my lab. Uh, beyond just our general group updates, if you watch the video, you'll have seen a presentation by Samit Agrawal on light emitting diode based photoacoustic imaging. Uh, photoacoustic imaging or Fourier acoustics is oftentimes used with a laser. So it's pretty cool that they're using light emitting diodes to create the same effect. Um, and then there's another talk by Molly Smallcomb on microscopic disruption of tendons using focused ultrasound. So the idea that we could use ultrasound to replace conventional therapies for uh, tendinopathies is pretty cool. Uh, so that's just the update I had. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I think now is a great time. 
and Molly and Samit are on if you'd like to ask questions of them. Yeah, I think, uh, Julie, that was quick. So I think uh, if Molly and Samit want to give their one minute uh, pitches with maybe a slide each, that'd be absolutely fine. I don't know if you want to bring up the slides or they do, but that'd be quicker if you do it. Uh, Samit, do you want to go ahead and give an update? I don't have your slides directly. I would just have the video, but. Oh, uh, maybe uh, can I share a screen or? Uh... Sure. Yeah. yeah, just maybe one slide and you know, less than a minute. Sure. Uh, just let me open. Just give me like 10 seconds. Okay. Oh, that's right. Kelly, you need to give uh, Samit uh, authority to share. He should be able to. Okay. Yeah, I got knocked out of the meeting, but like some kind of a Let's start. Yeah, yes, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, so in this work, basically in my talk, I have discussed about the use of light emitting diodes, which are much lower in the optical energy output. So for example, if you look on the left side of my slide, you have LED arrays, which are different, different wavelengths. And on the right side, you see a big bulky laser, which is like a tunable laser. It's like $100,000 laser, which people use for photoacoustic imaging usually. And in our lab, what we have done is we have tried to use the LED arrays for doing the photoacoustic imaging, starting from phantom and all the way to human imaging, human wrist imaging for precisely. So I'm going to show you some results from LED-based photoacoustic imaging, which we did for human vasculature. So this slide actually uh, details the results on human vasculature. So if you look on the first row, you can see that the vasculature of human wrist is pretty much clear with the laser and also with the LEDs. You can see from the depth 15 to 35 millimeters on the human wrist. And if you look at the uh, specific depth, for example, from the shallow depth versus deeper tissue regions, you do see that at the shallow depths, the maximum intensity projection from the laser versus LED arrays is actually almost the same. So you kind of see all the details which you can see with the lasers. However, if you compare at the deep tissue region, when you look at the laser imaging, you can see that after 25 millimeters, you tend to lose vascular information. With the LEDs, you can barely see some uh, Best vascular vasculature, whereas with laser, you, you do see some, some better information. So that's our uh, recent study, which is actually in preparation, and we're going to submit this. And uh, the next thing which I can talk uh, quickly is about the application of machine learning tools to further improve the deep tissue imaging capabilities of light emitting diodes in comparison to the lasers. So if you look at one of our recent works, uh, we proposed a convolutional neural network based approach. Yeah, Sumit, just a, a quick overview, but uh, <laughs> that's great. I think you've given us a pretty good flavor yeah. of uh, what you got going on. That's pretty neat. Thank you. Thank you. And any questions for Sumit? If you haven't uh, checked out his uh, uh, talk as part of uh, Julie's uh, talk, there's a lot of detail there. All right, uh, Molly, are you with us? Can you give us the, the one minute uh, quick speech on what you're up to? Yeah, hi everyone. Let me share my screen quick. Can you see this all right? Uh, so my, my name is Molly, I'm with Dr. Juliana Simon. Um, my research is in therapeutic focus ultrasound and applying it to tendons. Um, so, with therapeutic focus ultrasound, there are kind of two methods or two realms of bioffix that you can achieve. One is complete thermal ablation where you're cooking your tissue 
where, while the other end is more mechanical effects. So you create um, different kinds of bubbles and you can fractionate your tissue into these subfragments into homogenized tissue. Though um, where my research comes into play is that this mechanical effect isn't achievable in collagenous tissues like tendons. Um, but we have done some ex vivo studies applying a, a wide range of parameters, kind of um, going into the conventional parameters and past that. And we are seeing some forms of mechanical type disruption, like these are some slides looking underneath a microscope of fibers that are separating, or there's some type of disruption in this fiber pattern. And then of course, if you crank your energy up enough, you start getting the thermal effects again. So the point of this is to apply these micro damage type um, ideas to a chronically injured tendon to see if we can help induce this controllable healing in tendon to um, help heal them. All right, great. Okay, once again to the community, this uh, is a new group and uh, this is fascinating, just moving on into biomedical stuff. And I know it's not everybody's field of expertise, but yeah, I think there's definitely tools and techniques that we're seeing in the biomedical group that apply to the rest of us, especially with the imaging stuff and focusing of energy. Any questions for, uh, for Molly or Sumit or, or Julie? All right, thanks very much, guys. Uh, I think, uh, Jose, uh, you're up next with the Adaptive Structures and Noise Control Group. All right, can you guys hear me all right? We can. Good, good. Well, thank you very much for everybody to join. Uh, the biggest point I want to make across is uh, that we're here to help you. Uh, if you have any questions for our faculty or our students, uh, remember that we provide the one day free uh, advising, and that includes some of our experimental facilities. Uh, so with that, I would like to make the liaison with what uh, Dr. Kuhnman and Dr. Johnson were talking about, that we might have hit the wall on physics for acoustics. And uh, what we would like to do here at Penn State is develop facilities to see if we can introduce adaptive structures to fight these acoustics, for example. There is a presentation given by Raja that has been recorded that shows some of our new facilities. Uh, in this case, we're looking into coaxial vehicles but once again, we don't only want to look into the acoustics, we want to look into the adaptive structures as I am uh, leading the adaptive structures group. Uh, so I wanted to give a shout out to this presentation that is recorded and once again, open the door for our members to come use it. Uh, as you know, it's free for a day. So with that, let me go ahead and introduce our group. We are the adaptive structures and noise control group. Uh, we have quite a bit of a mixture of uh, faculty in this group from aerospace, mechanical engineering, uh, ESM, CEE, uh, and also people from ARL, our Applied Research Laboratory. And you can see that we work on piezoelectric actuations, synthetic jets, cable actuating uh, tensibility for deployable structures, all the way to shape memory alloys, fatigue optimization, and uh, passive balancing, for example, of supercritical shafts. So if you have a topic related to adaptive structures or noise control, uh, we'll urge you to contact us and see if we can be of any assistance. Um, in addition, I would like to give a brief shout out to one of our new members. The good thing about our group and, and the CAV group in general is that we are quite adaptive, <laughs> no, no pun intended. We always have new faculty joining our ranks and the students coming in and out. Um, this year, I would like to mention our new faculty member, Shin Nin, Aerospace Engineering, and some of the work he's done on multifunctional and deployable structures. And he's working on origami-based uh, foldable structures, which have limitless applications. Uh, you can think how you could integrate these kind of sensors or actuators uh, for your different applications. Uh, for example, we're, we're considering some of his uh, capabilities to measure dynamic pressures on rotor blades so we can quantify uh, performance degradations on these rotor blades using very non-intrusive stickers almost, right? You could stick these things right on top of the surface and measure pressures. Uh, another example would be some of his shape transformative microscale uh, structures. These are multifunctional structures that once again can be used for both actuation or sensing. Um, 
So with this brief introduction of one of our members, uh, once again, we have quite a bit of a spread of uh, people working on all kinds of different topics. And um, the one I showcased on a recorded video is related to um, work that we did for a uh, deployable uh, structure on the leading edge of a wing. And this is a hybrid electropneumatic system. So this adaptive structure uh, has been used by our group to do uh, ice protection of uh, fixed wind. In this case, we were working for the Air Force to prevent ice accretion on the Reaper. So I wanted to show you the video. This is recorded. Uh, so I, I want to hopefully pick your attention if you haven't looked at the whole presentation. And I'm going to show you need to show your screen if you're trying to. I'm not sharing yet. Ooh. Oh, <laughs> so okay. you guess I'm missing a lot of the stuff I've been saying yet. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, let me see. Share the screen. So you guys have been missing quite a bit. Okay, so at least you get to see this video. So this video I'm trying to show you here is the video from a recorded presentation. Once again, this is a uh, adaptive structure in the leading edge of an airfoil that is deployable. And let's see if it, this catches up to show you the video. Okay, uh, we did this for the Reaper wing and we use pneumatic pressures to deform the leading edge coupled with electrothermal power. And on the video, you're gonna see a full scale Reaper wing placed in the NASA IRT ice and wind tunnel. And you will see the ice accretion happening on the very leading edge. And at a given time, we sense the ice accretion and we deploy our actuation system to get rid of the ice. Once again, the ice is accretes and we're gonna turn on the system and right away we can get rid of these structures. And this is an example of many of the different uh, adaptive structures that we study at Penn State. Uh, since I wasn't sharing my screen, and I believe I am sharing it now, when I was talking about Shin's work, which is our new faculty at Penn State, I was talking about these foldable um, origami-based structures that can be used as sensors or actuators. And I also mentioned some of his three-dimensional uh, sensors and actuators uh, that he has developed. Uh, once again, this is also recorded on, on, the, on the CAV site. And the one that I originally shared with you that I was talking about was a rotor acoustic testing rig that we have, that we are developing here at Penn State. And this is some of the coupling between our adaptive structures and our rotor acoustics group. So we work quite closely together. And my goal here is not only to come up with passive uh, acoustic uh, prevention by looking at different rotor configurations, which I believe we do have hit the physical wall, but now introduce active uh, motion of the blades. Uh, think about trailing edge flaps, think about other structures that could adapt the shapes of the blades dynamically so we could counteract some of the interactions uh, between the two blades. So with that, uh, sorry that I wasn't sharing guys, I thought that I was. Uh, I will open the floor for, for questions if you have any. Um, I will be more than happy to answer. Okay, thanks Jose. Any questions? So Jose, on the, uh, the ice stuff, it, when I went through the brief, it looked like uh, you're kind of applying a static preload and then kind of hitting it with an impulse or a couple of impulses, have I got that right? Yes, yeah, so right now the technology out there, which is certified, is a pneumatic boot that gets inflated every so often and you introduce transfer shear stresses that break off the ice. Now, they use neoprene material, which has very high adhesion strength, and they require up to 100, 150 PSI to break off this ice, which is quite a bit of pressure. And the blade or the wing deforms quite a bit, right? It's like inflating a huge balloon. So the aerodynamics also get affected. So our technology uh, introduces inflation, but also a transient impulse. So we apply very small pressures in the order of five PSI. And as we're applying the pressure, we're holding the structure down. And once we reach a certain po point, we release it. So now you have the benefit of the deformation of the leading edge and the transient impulse that uh, creates trans transfer shear stresses to break off the ice. Uh, that's, that's kind of the trick we're doing. And we're doing everything uh, pneumatically. So we hold the structure down pneumatically with vacuum and we release it with pressure. Uh, in addition to that, we're coupling it with a small amount of electrothermal de-icing on the very leading edge to make sure that the ice is parted. What do I mean? If you have a cup of ice on the leading edge and you debond it, 
that ice will still float around, right? It, it doesn't really come off. Uh, so you have to have ice on the top and the bottom surface. So a parting strip uh, gives you those two icing shapes. Uh, for helicopter applications, which we're investigating as well, you do not need the electrothermal power because centrifugal forces will allow you to remove the ice. So we see a lot of potential of these very low weight uh, pneumatic systems, uh, which are you know, adaptive in nature. And we also see these systems as a, as a mean for changing the shape of the rotor blades to also assist with acoustics. And that's what we want to really explore on that yeah. stand that we show you on that PowerPoint. And by the way, yeah. if you guys are interested on this, there's a poster uh, set in the poster session. I think my students are gonna showcase some of these facilities. So if you're looking into test beds uh, to develop some of your concepts, uh, please contact us and, and we'll certainly help you. Great, thanks Jose. All right. So our next to last group is the uh, Systems and Structures Health Management Group. And we've got co-leads, Cliff Listenden and Carl Reichard. Hey, guys, have you decided who's gonna be given the, the overview or are you both gonna tag team it? We like to split things, Steve. So we're gonna split this too. All right. Hello everyone, this is Cliff. Let me share my screen here. Make sure I'm gonna share the right screen. Uh, am, I, am I sharing presenter view or? You gotta flip it. There okay. you go. All right. Well, again, um, hello everyone. I know we're at the end of the afternoon here. So I just wanna take a couple of minutes to give you a little bit of an update. I'm not gonna to try to re reiterate what's in the pre-recorded message. Uh, I wanna focus on a couple of things. Uh, first off is uh, at the last meeting 18 months ago, um, we talked about the fact that we have a number of new faculty in the ultrasonics area in our engineering science and mechanics department. Uh, so this is uh, Dr. Parissa Shokui, Dr. Jacques Riviere, Dr. Chris Kobe, and Dr. Andrea Arguelles. So that was great. They're here. So now what I want to kind of highlight is that they're all being very successful in going out and getting projects. So I wanna kind of focus on a few of their projects, some of which haven't even started yet. So um, this is a project that Dr. Aguelas uh, has gotten, well, she's the PI and uh, another ESM professor, uh, Dr. Christian Pecco is a co-PI and the um, collaborator is Dr. Francesco Simonetti from the University of Cincinnati. Um, so let me just give you a little backstory here. There's always backstories on these things, but a couple of years ago, I went to a conference in Vermont. So I drove there, I get there and I go into the hotel uh, to register. And there's uh, right at the same time coming in is uh, Francesco. And um, <clears throat> before we even got checked in, in five minutes time, I had learned all about cryo ultrasonics. Uh, he was very excited about using ice as a coupling for ultrasound in, uh, in propagation of solid media. Uh, you can see in the photograph here, this is a, uh, a disc that's embedded in ice. And the advantage of this is uh, the is a significantly reduced mismatch of acoustic impedance between the coupling, in this case ice, and the metal. And this is compared to immersion, right? So compared to immersion, you get a much better uh, matching between acoustic impedance. And that allows you to do much better imaging. So you want to image the part here. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I met him in the hotel before his wife and kids could even get into the lobby. He'd explain <laughs> it. So um, 
we arranged for him to come to Penn State and visit with us and give a seminar in our department. And from those conversations, uh, this successful project has uh, emanated. And so this one, what they're trying to do is to actually design the coupling. Uh, so not only can you use ice, but you can put particles, nanoparticles in the ice to change the impedance there and to change the, um, uh, the internal damping or the attenuative property of the, of the coupling. Um, so that's one project. Another project is uh, Dr. Kube, who um, uh, at least 30 minutes or so ago, he was online here. Uh, so he has gotten an award from the Department of Energy through the Nuclear Energy Enabling Technologies Program. And he has a number of collaborators um, at the additive manufacturing facility at Penn State, SIMP3D at North Texas and at Westinghouse. And uh, what they're trying to do is to sense microstructure and properties uh, um, that evolved during the additive manufacturing process with the aim of accelerating materials development and the qualification of additive manufacturing parts. Let me talk about um, one, uh, well, two others here. Um, so uh, this is a new project uh, from Dr. Shokui and Dr. Riviere in our CAV group and in engineering science mechanics. They collaborate with a number of other folks in geosciences here at Penn State, as well as at Los Alamos National Lab. So this is uh, an extension of a project that they have uh, where they're, uh, they're assessing the seismic and hydraulic as well as frictional properties of fractured rock. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the working group is aimed at um, health management of structures, but um, most of the people in the group do some other different things as well. And this is one of the other different things. Another one, the last one that I want to kind of highlight here is a multidisciplinary seed grant award that uh, Dr. Shokui got with uh, Daniel Kiefer, who is in the um, computer science. And uh, I wanted to highlight this one because of the workshop on Wednesday on machine learning and artificial intelligence, because that's what this project is about. Uh, is is uh, is using um, deep learning frameworks for analyzing acoustic data. And the last thing that I will say is from our department, this is a serious topic, right? So the I think the topic for the workshop was well selected. Our department is now starting uh, to look for faculty hire, uh, co-hire with uh, biomedical engineering. And the topic is artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. So with that, uh, Carl, I'll turn it over to you. Let me stop sharing here. OK, thank you, Cliff. Hello, everybody. Uh, hello from uh, what's been a very nice uh, Indian summer here in central Pennsylvania, but is now looking kind of like the season's turn. So. Uh, as Cliff said, we had a video that we made for everybody to view that summarizes a lot of the projects that are ongoing in the working group. I had a couple of projects that I described in there that specifically are taking place at the Applied Research Lab. Uh, you've heard, you're probably familiar with the Applied Research Lab uh, by now, but you've heard about a lot of the projects that we have going on here. The focus in this area, in the Systems and Structures Health Monitoring, uh, area in my group at ARL has been following a couple of trends lately, and I thought I'd mention those briefly. Uh, one has been the increasing reliance or interest, at least, from the sponsor community on the application of AI and machine learning. So that's one of the reasons for the special roundtable workshop on Wednesday morning. And as uh, Cliff described, there are several other projects uh, of a very, ba you know, basic nature going on within the group there. 
one of the things that we're seeing is our sponsors are very interested in you know, how to make better use of all of the data that they're currently collecting. Years ago, when we were faced with a project where we wanted to monitor the health of you know, a wing or a diesel engine or some other component on, on an asset, we would identify uh, sensor locations, and phenomena that we wanted to measure, and we would put dedicated sensors on and a dedicated health monitoring box and embed all of our processing in, in, that, in that unit. And that uh, has a lot of cost associated with it. Sometimes uh, if you're not in the, in the manufacturing world, you'd probably be surprised to know that uh, the cost of the wiring and modifications of drawings and things like that can often exceed the costs of the sensors and the electronics that you're trying to, to add on to the system to do that monitoring. But as systems have, monitor, uh, have modernized, uh, there have been the addition of many more sensors and processors on these, on these systems and vehicles. Uh, you, if you look at your automobile right now, you have probably 20 or more microcontrollers running at different places on the on your vehicle and they're all collecting data that they're using as part of the control algorithm. So there's been a big push to look and see how we can use that data that's already being collected on the platforms to assess the health. And one of the tools that we're using in those realms are machine learning. So in the in the presentation that we recorded and what's included in the CAV annual report are descriptions of two projects in particular. One that's looking at monitoring the health of robots that are used in the assembly process for aircraft. So these robots are drilling holes in the fuselage and they are supposed to be very precise. You want those holes to be in a very a precise location and the drilling operations have to meet uh, qualifications for, you know, uh, for the size and the depth of the holes. And as either the robots wear or the cutting tools wear, you'll get a degradation in, the, in that manufacturing process. So we're looking at using low cost sensors and low cost data acquisition systems to collect primarily motor current data. And we're trying to find within that motor current data faults in the motors or where in the uh, cutting tools, in this case, drill bits. In another project that I have with the Office of Naval Research, we're looking at a little more of a big picture of how do we improve the capability to do prognostic health management in general. In, in this field, traditionally, we have looked at the trends of you know, particular indicators, whether those are single sensors or combinations of sensors that we understand to have a bearing on the health or the performance of a particular asset or a subsystem within an asset. And we've looked at the rates of change of those signals, the trajectory of those signals, and then based on either our own subject matter expertise or historic data, we've set thresholds and we've said, okay, when this single indicator crosses this threshold, that's when we're going to take action. Um, as, as we get into more complicated structures and we start to look at performance of systems and assets at kind of a more global view, we know that we need to take into account a lot of other data and information that's not captured by single sensors. Things like what were the last maintenance actions that were taken? How was the asset used? Uh, was a truck driven with a lot of light loads or was it driven uh, with very heavy loads? Was there a lot of heavy braking going on or was it driven in a manner that was very careful and didn't really stress the system much? And so looking at how do we bring all of those different data feeds into our algorithms to then look at the progression of the system through various stages of life. 
and looking at can we do a better job of predicting the remaining useful life in these assets. So those are some general trends that we're seeing in this area. We'll talk more about this in the AI ML roundtable on Monday. And uh, there are links to the people that are working on these projects. We have several good graduate students that are working on in this area. A couple that are graduating and looking for jobs as well. So I'd be happy to point you in their way. Uh, there are a couple of student posters in the poster session on Wednesday, uh, Tuesday as well. Great, thanks, Paul. Just a quick clarification that AI machine learning is on Wednesday. Wednesday morning, morning sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Okay, I know we're running uh, late, which is fine, but uh, any questions for Carl or Cliff? All right. Yeah, I'm starting to, <laughs> to wonder about Zoom meetings. We're just not getting a whole lot of interaction here. I'm really hoping we're live next year. Um, okay, so I'm last, and I did that on purpose because I wanted to give everybody else a chance to go before me. Uh, so let me talk a bit about the structural vibration and acoustics group. And thanks to those of you that have hung on to the end. And I'm going to need a check from somebody to make sure you're seeing the, the whole screen and not the speaker view. Looks good. Thank you. All right. So um, I'm pleased to welcome three new faculty members this year to the Structural Vibration Acoustics Group. We've got Sez uh, from Civil, uh, Nathan Brown, I think from Architectural, and Danning Wong, uh, who's actually uh, co-leading the AI Machine Learning uh, meeting on uh, Wednesday. So welcome to all of you. Great additions. Uh, we mentioned the student poster competition a few times. I'm not just going to read these off, but uh, we do have five people in our group as part of that competition. So if you're into structural vibration acoustics, there's some uh, cool stuff we'd have a look at tomorrow afternoon in a variety of different areas. Uh, there's a fair bit of other stuff going on, and I'd refer you to the newsletter for some of the details on these particular topics. And what I'm going to get to in a minute is like the three that I want to give some highlights on uh, this year, but uh, there's obviously a lot more going on than uh, the three I'm going to show you. And traditionally, I just show you the work of the students that have recently graduated. And I try to have the students do it, but um, they're all gone. Actually, Trevor, I think, was online a minute ago. So he, uh, if he's still online, can correct any mistakes I make when uh, I talk about uh, his work. But here are some... Um, projects that uh, just got completed that uh, I think are really neat. Uh, one, the both the joint dynamics problem, which just plagues us all in, in industry and government, trying to get a handle on how in the heck to properly model a bolted joint um, and an FE model. And then uh, Carrier, and Lee Titu, I think is online, uh, funded a project with Steve Wells, just finished his PhD, looking at uh, large children noise and vibration. It was quite challenging. And then uh, Gage Walters just uh, finished up. And this is a project I've been hoping would get done for many years now. And that is finally adding um, a way to add uncertainty estimates to a flow induced and or vibroacoustic uh, simulations. So we always just sort of predict a uh, quantity without really usually giving how certain we are in its results. So um, details of all of these are in the pre recorded brief. And I did see a couple of questions on them. Uh, let me start off with a bolted plate. Uh, this is a pretty simple problem, but boy, it took Trevor a lot of years to get to the bottom of it. Uh, anytime you bolt a couple of structures together, you wind up with all kinds of nonlinear behavior in that interface. And what I'm showing you here are a couple of different mode types. Uh, the top one is we've got these two plates bolted together along a flange, and it's just vibrating and bending. And as the plate vibrates, what happens is you wind up with these uh, fang surfaces, we call them. Uh, kind of coming undone and then slapping back again. So you get this intermittent impact happening. Um, and then maybe right around the bolt, you might have uh, kind of a no-slip region where you've got a lot of uh, pressure. And Trevor talks about that quite a bit in his thesis. And then outside that bolt, you get this kind of slapping. And these phenomena show up uh, in pretty distinct ways in uh, vibration patterns. Uh, I think my friends in the st structural health monitoring people have seen this kind of thing in opening and closing cracks all the time, except now this is a bigger scale uh, with the opening and closing joint. 
and then here's another kind of mode. This is a torsional mode of our overall system. We've got twisting of one end and twisting of the other. But now the behavior of the joint is very different. Now you're shearing it. You've got this kind of in-plane shear right around the bolt. And as it oscillates, you kind of flip back and forth between stuck and unstuck. Uh, the stiffness is varying with time. The damping that you're getting with the frictional losses is varying with time. And so you know, how the heck do you figure that out? Uh, so have a look at Trevor's thesis. It's available on our um, CV website, as I mentioned earlier. If you have trouble finding it, let me know. But uh, he looks at this in a lot of different ways, measurements, simulations. And we're not completely there yet, but we certainly got a lot more insight than we had uh, before Trevor started. Uh, the next project is the Carrier Chiller. And uh, when this project first started, um, we thought we would have to go to Carrier to do all of our work. Uh, the good news was we didn't have to do that. There's a whole bunch of Carrier Chillers right on the Penn State West Campus. And one of the first things that Steve Wells did in his work is uh, turned out that the fine folks from Polytech were visiting us and they were marketing something called an acoustic camera. And uh, they were happy to run out to the plant and kind of aim the camera at the uh, chiller. And one of the things we learned very early on was uh, how important this discharge pipe is to the vibration and noise that come from these large chillers. So the compressor's back here and it's compressing refrigerant and then shoving it through this 90 degree elbow into the condenser. And then all of the refrigeration cycle stuff happens after that. But the tones that are emitted by the uh, spinning impeller in there were interacting or are interacting with uh, modes of vibration of this discharge pipe. And there's a variable frequency drive on there. And if that frequency happens to align with the mode, then you get a lot of vibration and sound. Uh, so uh, a lot of Steve's work was looking at trying to predict all that using a hybrid model where he had a combination of measurements, modal behavior, transfer functions, uh, as well as finite element and statistical energy analysis models. So a lot of good work uh, in that uh, thesis. And I'm going to throw this in because I think this feeds in nicely to the uh, Wednesday AI machine learning thing. The amount of data that Steve acquired is just insane. Uh, he pretty much left a whole bunch of microphones and accelerometers on for months. And the way these chillers work, and this, this is something I had to learn and Steve had to learn as we went through this, is that they're never really operating on design. There might be sometimes this green line here indicates a kind of perfect on design behavior of the compressor as a function of flow and head. Uh, but the bulk of the time they're off design, usually a little bit less head than, uh, than on design. And so all of these data points have different vibration and noise spectra associated with them. And a lot of these are worse than others for various reasons. This is well beyond what Steve's thesis uh, needed to do, but I thought I'd show this because this is a big challenge. How do you digest all of this? How do you use machine learning to go in and find the conditions which give you like really bad vibration and sound? And then what the heck do you do about it? So this is not a solved problem, but I thought this was a nice indication of uh, the problem that a lot of us face when we're confronted with a lot of big data. Uh, mentioned the uh, uncertainty calculations. This is a flow-induced plate vibration problem and actually a flow-induced plate radiation problem. So uh, there was a turbulent boundary layer excitation applied to the plate. The plate then vibrated, radiated sound, and uh, gauge went off and uh, predicted the vibration, but he also predicted how certain we are in that uh, radiated sound uh, spectrum. So these are uncertainty bands, I think 95% confidence. And there are a bunch of uncertain variables that got dumped into this. One was uncertainty of the turbulence itself. And uh, the other was uncertainty of the plate and the plate material properties, uh, most notably Young's modulus and uh, I think some damping. And then up here is a, an alpha term. This is the correlation of the turbulent boundary. And the orange you're seeing here is the uncertainty. And so you got higher uncertainty right around the residence peaks and kind of a floor of maybe two or three dB uncertainty everywhere else. And the cool thing here is he's showing you uh, that in blue, this is how much the turbulent correlation uncertainty contributes to the overall uncertainty. It's pretty much this sort of broad band, plus or minus a couple of dB. And the uncertainty in the material properties uh, gives you a big uncertainty right around the peak. So if the material property is uncertain, the residence frequency shifts up and down, and uh, that gives you uncertainty right around the residence peaks. So uh, that was a really cool discovery there. All right, so that is a quick overview of some big projects that just got completed.
And I know it's late and we're down a fair bit in our number of participants, but uh, happy to take uh, questions on that. This is Trevor. I was just saying, I think you did a great job summarizing my slides. No worries there. <laughs> well, thank you, Trevor. And thanks for hanging on to the bitter end. So if anybody has detailed questions about Boulder Joint Research, uh, Trevor, who now works at Carter Rock, uh, is online. Any questions for Trevor? Anybody else? All right. Um, for those of you watching this after the fact, if you have any questions about any of this work or the pre-recorded talks, uh, hit us up, send us emails, put a comment on the YouTube, uh, any way works. Uh, we're happy to get back in touch with you and re-engage. So with that, thank you very much for participating. This was strange, but I think useful. I hope useful. Uh, feedback is welcome. Uh, hope we're not doing this again next year, but if we are, uh, any uh, guidance would be uh, much appreciated to help us do a better job next time around. So thanks all, and uh, hope you guys are able to join us with uh, some of the uh, sessions tomorrow. Thank you, Steve. Good job. Steve. Thank you.